Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, I, um, you all were here um, last Saturday for Bill's funeral. I um, ended up, as most preachers do, with three points in my remarks about Bill. I feel like uh, this morning, what I said then, um, I, I'm going to... I'm just going to go over those three points again, just briefly, because I want you to see how it is that your life can align with what it says in the scripture, whether you know it's there or not. So the first thing I said about Bull, Bill was, or Bull, <laughs> the first thing I said about Bill was uh, you can be positive about things even when things aren't good. And I watched that happen in Bill and Linda's life. They made peace with Bill's choice to let nature take its course. And in Philippians, it says, Finally, my friends, keep your mind on whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is holy, whatever is friendly and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile. And I think the reason Bill could be positive about everything going on in his life as he kept his mind focused the way it says in Philippians to focus. Keep your mind on whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is right and holy and friendly and proper. And then the second thing I said about Bill is you can always make other people feel good about themselves. Always. That is within your power. Mark 9.50 gives us that instruction. Be at peace with each other. I had never, had never read that until I was getting prepared for this sermon. That's funny. I grew up in church, and I do not remember a pastor ever reading that scripture. In Ephesians, it says, Always be humble and gentle. Patiently put up with each other with love. Patiently put up with each other with love. I guarantee I never heard that one because I had three little brothers. And I had parents who would say, weren't you listening in church today? And they would have used that scripture, I'm telling you right now. Always be humble and gentle. Patiently put up with each other and love each other. Now, this is not the King James Version. This is from the Common English Bible. The one I like to read because um, King James and I are not, we're not friends. Um, I don't understand everything written in the King James language. Uh, John 15, 17, God commands us, Jesus Christ commanded us, I command you to love each other. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to that church at Corinth. What happens if the ear says, I'm not an eye and so I'm not part of the body? Doesn't the ear still belong to the body? You can make other people feel good about themselves, first of all, by being humble and patient with them. This is the part where I'm preaching to myself, and you just get to listen, okay? You can make other people feel good about themselves just by showing them a little love and kindness. And I know there are times in your life when you've said, I don't belong here. I'm not part of this. But I'm going to tell you, ear, that not, just because you're not the eye doesn't mean you're not part of this body and part of this family. And feeling like you belong includes somebody making you feel good about yourself, feel good about being here. And so practice that with each other as we're commanded to do by our Lord. And then the last thing we learned from Bill was not something I, I don't think Bill realized he was teaching us. But Bill taught me to mark every moment and to make peace on every front because you never know when your last moment with somebody will be your last moment with them. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks to them and says to them, it'll happen suddenly. Death will come quicker than the blink of an eye. And the Lord will return someday. And at the sound of that trumpet, the dead will be raised. And we will all be changed. 
so that we never die again. I sat in a room, I sat in here, 160 people came for Bill's service. Most of those people in the room didn't know that the last time they saw Bill would be the last time they saw Bill. And so their grief was great. And I think our church learned a couple of things that day. First of all, we learned that the Bill we saw here that we loved and that was such a major life force in this church family was just the tip of the iceberg. We had no idea who he was outside of here and in the rest of his life. And I think the other thing that I learned, I hope you learned that day from Bill, is to mark every moment with you. Because none of us has that guarantee, right? None of us. And so today we're going to talk about making peace. We're going to talk about making peace with life, first of all. Because there are things that exist in all of our lives that we carry with us. Baggage. We don't carry them because they're good things. We carry them because they're traumatic things. Things that tore our hearts in two. Things that we don't know how to let go of. And when you contemplate your life looking back from where you are, you can usually see growth and change. Some people even go so far as to say, yes, this bad thing happened, but my life is better because of it. I'm very careful about looking at it that way. I can see that in my past traumas, I have grown from them. I can see that. But sometimes the trauma was deep and painful, and so I still have to work through it. So I want you to listen to me. I want you to understand when I say to you, making peace with life involves making peace with your trauma. What I want you to hear from that is you're not going to always grow or get stronger from the traumas that you face. Sometimes you have to take them out and hold them in your hands and examine them and tear them down. And you have to turn them over in your hands and maybe relive some of them, which is difficult and painful. But it's the only way to then just release them and be done with them. Let the universe have that mess back and let your life be peaceful. We sang, um, It Is Well With My Soul. We sang that song because peace with life looks like that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Making peace with death is also something that is important in our lives. Because no matter how old you are right now, you will never be as young as you are right now. You just won't. We're all headed to the same outcome. Research shows 100% of us. This machine that carries us around, it's going to break down. And it may break down over and over and over until it no longer works. How many of you have had a used car like that? right? And you just keep pouring money into it and pouring money into it and pouring money into it until you get to a point where you say, I've put so much money in this car, I can't let it die now. And you just keep putting money into it and keep putting money into it. That's how our bodies are. These bones, these muscles and skin, all of this though, it's temporary because our souls are eternal. And so making peace with death is only saying goodbye to this machine. That's all it is. Now there are some days my knees hurt so bad and my back is sore and I'm exhausted and I think, Lord, can I just get a newer model? <laughs> can we get rid of this one? Boy, that, my warranty ran out a long time ago. And so uh, there are times when I'm ready to get rid of this body and to be just a free soul experiencing eternal life with God. Now, I want to talk to you just for a minute about a little business. On the table in the back of 
the fellowship hall is something called a vial of life. And I'm doing this for, for Bill Parker. I'm doing this for Bill. Because Bill had things so arranged in his life that he even wrote his own funeral service. He told us which music we, he wanted to hear. And we learned that Happy Trails to You is a sacred song. But inside this vial of life is a paper where you write down your health history. It looks like this. You write down your health history. You write down who your next of kin will be. You write down where the location of your uh, living will is or your advanced care planning documents. You write down all your medicines that you're on and what, they're, what you take them for. On the back, you write down your allergies, your histories of your whatever illness or surgeries you've had. You write down your pharmacy. You write down your physicians. And you write all that information on here and you fold it back up and you put it in this container and you put the lid on it and this container goes in your refrigerator. And on your front door, you put this sticker. Or on the outside of your refrigerator, you put this sticker. And that way, when 911 gets called and the police show up or the firefighters or paramedics show up, they know everything about you, whether you can speak or not. Now, how many of you picked up one of these this morning? Keith, because you know why? He's the only one that got a shot. They're on that table. I have, there's, I have 40 back there. I have 40 more in my car. If you need two pieces of paper because you've got so much wrong with you, pick up two, all right? If you've got, if you've got people who live with you, pick up one for them. Every single one of you, no matter what your age is, you need this information somewhere where it can be easily accessed. All right? Okay, that commercial's over. Because even this won't save you from your body breaking down completely at one point in your life. But we hold on to this machine, though, don't we? Man, we hold on to these bodies with all we're worth. We spend money on our bodies. We feed our bodies. And then we turn around and we starve it <laughs> because we fed it too much. Only it doesn't work anymore. And so then we feed it some more. And then we starve it some more. And it's no wonder it hangs on to this belly fat because it doesn't know what you're doing. One minute you're eating. The next minute you're starving. Your belly and your body are confused. We give our bodies water and we give them sleep. We make them fit. We walk and we exercise. And then we sit on our couches until we can't move anymore. <laughs> we abuse these machines and we love these machines. And we use them up. When God gets all of us to heaven, there's not going to be a body left that can be recycled. Because we have used them. But one day, ready, when we're ready or not, his body says, this machine says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. It's up to you now. So making peace with death, it's a difficult, but it's a necessary task. Making peace with others. Jesus told Peter to forgive them seven times 70, 490 times. Now, do I think Jesus was being literal? No. I think he was exaggerating a little bit to prove the point. He was using hyperbole to get his point across. There is no end to the number of times you need to forgive each other. And that is hard for us to do. It is hard for us to do. Part of the reason it's hard for us to do is because we're still carrying that little trauma baggage around with us. And so if something somebody does to us as an adult opens the suitcase and the pain and the tears and the agony and the suffering start to come back out. And so whatever this person did to us at the age of 60 triggers whatever happened to us at the age of six. And so this poor person over here who didn't really know you at six years of age gets 60 years of trauma, 54 years 
of anger, 54 years of resentment. Right? <laughs> We've got to learn to make peace with others. We've got to learn to let that stuff go so that we can be at peace with each other, so that we can forgive each other, because that's our responsibility. It is our responsibility to forgive each other. Love each other, forgive each other. It was simple. God made it simple because He knew I was going to have to do it. God made it simple. Examining your own life, though, because you want to make peace with people that you don't have a good relationship with, well, that, that can be very tedious. Because it's more exciting, right, to sit in a room full of people that you love. It's more exciting and more fun to sit in a room of people who have your same opinion about things, right? We call that a vacuum. Sitting in a vacuum where you never hear anything except those things that already match exactly what you believe. But I don't think that's what God has in mind for us. I don't think that's our responsibility, folks. Our responsibility is to make a place at the table for everyone and then learn to listen and to learn to always lead with love and forgiveness. I read something this week that I really, I really liked because I struggle with this one. I struggle, especially now in our, when our society is just so contentious and we are so pitted against each other. I have a hard time. There are times I stay home because I know wherever it is I'm going, there are going to be people there who are not politically or, more importantly, spiritually, spiritual tradition, the people who aren't aligned with my belief system. And I don't, I don't want to hear them talk. I don't have anything to say to them. You know what? I'm wrong. I'm wrong for that. How can I show them I love them if I never go to their house when they invite me? How can I show them what God said for me to do 500 times, forgive them, if I'm not there? There's only so many excuses for missing a birthday party or a dinner. And pretty soon people are going to start to figure out, well, they must not want to be around me. And so making peace with others is a big part of making peace. We sang, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. What I read this week said, it is okay to respect someone's right to believe what they believe and not respect their belief. So you can say to those people, I respect your right to believe what you believe. But I want you to know with all the love in my heart, I think you're crazy. No, just don't say that. You've lost your mind. You, you fill in the blank. Say whatever you want there. I'm pretty sure that's not what Jesus said, though. But you see, the message of the church has always been to point out that God is love and that everyone is welcome at God's table. And if we're not just, if we're not doing more than just saying it, if our actions don't match our beliefs, then there's no way for them to know that that's who we are and what we believe. Because, folks, people are looking for a place like this. How many of you, after you got settled into this church for a while, realized, I have never been in a church like this before in my life? Most of you. Most of us. We come here week after week after week because there's nothing else in the world that exists for us like this church and this congregation, this choir, this pastor, this message that God is love and we are God's beloved. Making peace with others sometimes mean, means inviting them to our church. Now, it's an election year in case you didn't know. I will tell you that Kamala Harris is stalking me. I get 10 or 15 text messages from her a day. Four or five emails. She's on my TV. She's on my radio. Everywhere I turn. It's an election year. 
and it is a contentious election year. And I am a firm believer in the separation of church and state. And so I will not talk politics with you from the pulpit, but I will talk to you about the fact that even if the church is separated from the state, our voice still needs to be heard. People still need to hear that God is love and everyone is God's beloved. And what's happened because the, the, the politicians have absconded with the Christian religion. And Christian nationalism has written, risen to a point where our voice is no longer heard. That voice that God is love and that all are welcome is being drowned out. I was at a, uh, Winston and I went to Abilene a few weeks ago. We were at a, a, a conference, a convening conference. 15,000 voices, 1,000 Meth United Methodists all singing together one song. We're not all going to vote for the same candidate. We don't all have the same political beliefs. But we all believe that God is love. We all worship that same risen Christ. And so, yes, while I believe that there needs to be a separation of church and state, that the church needs get, get, to get back to doing the business of the church. The front of your bulletin today, it's not very pretty. It's not a sweet picture of angels and sunrises. None of those things. You know what this is? This is the business of the church right here. These are outreach ministries where people without shelter, without clothing, without access to food and water, they're going to show up here and they're going to have needs. And the church, this church, you guys are great about bringing whatever we need. The women's group, this week, right? This week? Was it this week? Worked on putting together feminine hygiene bags. Did y'all do that this week? There were questions. Are you going to do it? <laughs> really? Come on, don't make me look bad. Soon. Not yet, but soon, right? They made blankets this week. How nice. That is beautiful. This, this is the work of the church. And you know what? There wasn't enough room on here for me to put everything that's going on. But the next time you see it, it'll be in a regular font and it'll be full again. It may be two pages of the work of the church. These bulletins are not meant for you to just toss in the recycle anymore. I mean, you can, but take this front page with you and put it on your refrigerator. Give yourself a reminder as you're getting a can of beans out of the cabinet. Oh, I need to take a pound of beans to Eastside Ministry. Give yourself a reminder as you're making your shopping list for Thanksgiving. Oh, I need to get turkey, I mean, not turkey, I need to get stuffing and gravy and, and sweet potatoes and everything else, pumpkin pie for Eastside Ministry, all right? Use this as a reminder, make this a tool. So making peace with God is another thing. And I saved it for last because I think making peace with God is the hardest thing to do. Because we have forgotten the fact that God relentlessly pursues us for relationship. All of us. Not just me. Not just these kiddos. Not just folks who are almost there in heaven with God. All of us. God has pursued us relentlessly from the beginning. And those of us who grew up in congregations and in churches who made us feel unworthy, it was hard for me to come back to God. I carried those feelings with me into adulthood and I kept thinking my whole life, God couldn't possibly love me. Look what a sinner I am. When we sang Amazing Grace, we talked about that wretched worm, a worm such as I. It was horrible. And so making peace with God is difficult for some folks. It happens in stages, though. It's still happening with me. There are things in my life, as I release them, I find myself making peace with God. But to make peace with God, you have to suspend all the lies that you tell yourself about yourself. 
You have to let those things go. Making peace with God means that you are taking on the mantle of God's beloved. Making peace with God means that you know that this body, this machine that carries around your soul is God's creation and that you are created in God's image. And we have this promise from Paul. He, he wrote this to the church at Philippi. He says, then God's peace, which goes beyond anything we can imagine, will guard our thoughts and emotions through Christ Jesus. And we're going to sing a song in a minute called, I Know Whom I Have Believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Folks, the only thing we can commit to God is us, ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our spirits. We can commit to God. Everything else He gave us, she gave us, God gave us. I try not to be gender specific when it comes to God. All right. I'm going to say a prayer right now. And it, it's a responsive prayer. And so I want, we're going to join our hearts and our voices together. I'm going to read a statement. And your response is, O oh Lord, deliver us. Let's try it together. You ready? O oh Lord, deliver us from self-righteousness that will not compromise and from selfishness that gains by the oppression of others. O oh Lord, deliver us from the lust for money or power that drives to kill. O oh Lord, deliver us from trusting in the weapons of war and mistrusting the counsels of peace. O oh Lord, deliver us from hearing, believing, and speaking lies about other nations. O oh Lord, deliver us from suspicions and fears that stand in the way of reconciliation. O oh Lord, deliver us from words and deeds that encourage discord, prejudice, and hatred, from everything that prevents us from fulfilling your promise of peace. O oh Lord, deliver us. And all the people said, Amen.